Welcome. This is Dr. David D. Shine, a professor and associate dean over at the University of St. Thomas. I do want to make it clear any comments I make are mine and they're not attributable to the university or any other organization that I happen to be associated with. This is Saving America for this week, and we have an interesting and busy show for you. We want to start by uh, greeting you and telling you a little bit about myself. I'm the author of a book, The Decline of America, 100 Years of Leadership Failures, and uh, which is, of course, available on Amazon and other reputable sources distributed by Simon & Schuster. I'm also working on a new book, and we'll tell you some more about that in a future episode, but not today. So we want to visit a little bit as we uh, greet you from what I call Venezuela North, as our country sinks into a Marxist occupation, which was not, frankly, anticipated with the new administration. So we're going to start with In the News. Uh, we're going to talk about the rumor of the week. And then we have a special guest today. We have a marketing expert, a wonderful person, a personal friend of mine, Hyatt Ives is going to come in and talk about something that isn't talked about a lot, but inaugural addresses. So that'll be our Just the Facts segment. You say, hey, and that's your final answer. So let's get right down to it within the news. And one of the things that I wanted to do is to express my condolences. I just heard that uh, Congressman Ron Wright from Texas has passed away at age 67 from COVID, apparently a cancer survivor. Um, he was uh, not able to uh, tolerate the, the uh, infection and unfortunately passed away. He is the first active member of Congress to pass away from COVID. And again, I extend my condolences to his family and to his constituents. We also wanna talk a little bit about what's happening in America right now. Uh, Joe Biden, in my opinion, at least my prior opinion, isn't a very bright guy, not a very successful guy, but I don't think he's a far left Marxist. However, his actions in the first two and a half weeks since he's been in office have been, uh, if nothing, a failure and, a, and indeed a concern because not everything that Trump did was wrong and he seems to be hell bent on changing everything that Trump did by executive order and some things that Trump did properly through the Congress by executive order also because he knows he's not going to get some of this far left stuff through the Congress and there's starting to be rumors and pushback because some of these folks who are elected are worried about getting elected in 2022 with such a far left and agenda, which frankly bodes poorly for the United States in the future. So let's take a look at just some of the things. First of all, what did Donald Trump bring to the table? Energy independence, record low unemployment, a record stock market, which represented a tremendous surge from the Obama administration. Uh, and uh, what do we have now? We had a grudging respect internationally. So some people have said some of our allies didn't like Trump. Well, no wonder they didn't like Trump. He was telling them to pay their dues to NATO and to other organizations. And he was insisting that the United States be treated more fairly in trade deals. Gee, no wonder people a little bit rumpled up about him, but I don't think that they want a weak America. So what have we had since uh, uh, Biden was elected? We've got Iran dictating terms to the United States, despite the fact that they are flagrantly out of compliance with the bogus Iran peace deal from 2015. A failed deal, no question about it. Trump did the right thing, take us out of it. Biden says he's gonna put us back in it. What to put back in? The deal's a dead deal as far as I can tell. China has started dictating terms to us. And why? Because Trump's not in office anymore. Just thinking about it, this is a tough situation. So like I said, I've been surprised because I regard Biden more as a centrist and I am surprised at his far left uh, appeasement effort. I think, unfortunately, it will be unsuccessful. Uh, there have been uh, riots 
um, around the country that were not anticipated and they have nothing to do with Trump. They've happened since Biden's election and they are clearly being sponsored by anarchists and by groups like Antifa. And so there are definitely problems in America and Biden's election did not solve that. His early moves in his uh, election have not solved it. And I don't think they're gonna be solved by weakening police departments around the country. So what else have we got going on for us? Well, how about the rumor of the week? Uh, and a bill has been proposed uh, with a bizarre incorrect name as many bills coming from the left are. This one's called Protecting the Right to Organize Act. Now we already have a right to organize. It's called the National Labor Relations Act, a very powerful pro-union law that was passed during the Great Depression. That law is still in effect today. We have an entire organization, the National Labor Relations Board under the National Labor Relations Act that enforces the right of people to unionize. The reality is, is that the United States being a pretty significant organization of free thinkers um, is not a pro-union country. We do have some unionization in certain industries like transportation, uh, oil and gas. Uh, the public sector unions have been about the only unions that have surged over the last 30 or 40 years. Unionization in the private sector in the United States is below 10%. So in any event, we've got a bill that they, the acronym is PRO. And what this would do is it would basically take away the independent contractors in America. Now, independent contractors, as speaking as someone with employment law expertise, have been abused. There are people who are legitimately employees who are being counted as independent contractors. That is not correct. That is something our federal government, the Wage Hour Division, the IRS, the organizations like that, state agencies, the unemployment commissions should be enforcing it to make sure that people are paid fairly if they truly are employees. However, we have a very active gig economy and we have successes like Uber and Lyft. And we have a lot of people who enjoy working from home and having their own freedom and having their own small businesses. The PRO Act is basically a rehashed version of a bill in California, which basically made everybody an employee instead of an independent contractor. The California bill has been such a failure that they had to pass a separate amendment to it to allow people in Uber and Lyft to continue to be independent contractors. Not a very good sign for the future. And as you know, California for the first time has had a loss in population and is bleeding businesses. Where are they going to Texas? Well, we don't have stupid laws that prohibit independent contractors, but we do have law enforcement that says if someone's truly an employee, they need to be classified as an employee. Why is this relevant to the pro bill? Because if you're not an employee, you can't organize in a union. There's no reason to, you're an, you're an independent contractor. You're not an employee to be unionized. So I am on this, the side of not further restricting independent contractors, but enforcing the laws that we already have. And of course, enforcing the right of the few individuals who do want to unionize in the private sector to seek unionization. And that's in the news and in the rumors today. And now we turn to our special guest, Hyatt Ives, for Just the Facts. Just the Facts, ma'am. And welcome to our third segment today for Saving America. And my special guest today is Hyatt Ives, one of the great American marketers and also a super person and one of the most interesting people you'd ever care to meet. And I'm very happy to call him my friend. And we've invited Hyatt to come talk with us for a few minutes this afternoon in our Just the Fact segment to talk a little bit about context in inaugural speeches. Hyatt, it's your floor. Well, that was worth every bit of the 10 cents I paid you for that introduction. Thank you, Dave. Uh, we're looking at um, George Washington, 
his inaugural address and Joe Biden and his inaugural address. Uh, you had Dave uh, uh, responded to a deal that I had uh, words used by Washington and um, uh, very uh, high high caliber and, and, and positive words. And, and um, just one of the deals in, in here, he talked about the propitious smiles of heaven can never be expected on a nation that disregards the eternal rules of order and right, which heaven itself has ordained. Now, you, you, you contrast that against um, Biden, who said, uh, we come together as one nation. Democracy has prevailed. Uh, we have much to repair, much to restore, much to build, much to heal, and much to gain. But we cannot do it while divided against ourselves. My whole soul is in this, bringing America together. So it, the, 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 the tone is so much different and the approach is so much different that uh, uh, I just wanted to sort of put that on the table. Well, it, it, it's fascinating to me because Biden's uh, presentation sounds a great deal more like Lincoln's second inaugural address where he talks about a nation divided. And it's, it's interesting because uh, he then spent the next two weeks trying to undo everything that Trump did. And uh, as I said in my opening segment today, uh, not Trump did a lot of good stuff and it seems to have been washed over. And uh, it, it's the speech seems to lack a, a, a certain eloquence which Washington uh, clearly uh, portrayed in the way he presented things. I remember Washington was a career military man. We're not, he wasn't an English professor. Absolutely. He was, he was in the, the Dwight Eisenhower uh, mold, if you will. Well, but he, he also used some beautiful language in terms of addressing America. And I wondered if you want to talk a little bit about some of the other uh, terms that he used that, that were in your essay. Uh, that I, I think you backed into it a minute ago, but what triggered my thought about uh, this presentation was that you had uh, sent out a, a, an email of, about a week ago uh, indicating some of the terms that Washington used in his first inaugural address. And I thought they were, it, it really caught my attention. Yeah, and, and there were words that are, are um, some would call them 25 cent words, but, but actually, you know, they, they were very meaningful words. And I'm desperately, looking for the page where they are all listed here. Uh, and uh, come on, Hyatt, here we go. Um, the um, uh, in inimitable, uh, the, the um, transcendent uh, discernment, you know, uh, beyond, beyond the ordinary limits, the, the um, Magnanimous, the high-minded or noble, uh, as in Washington, felt that uh, that a magnanimous government would help America prosper. Um, so there are words like that 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 you don't you don't hear in in um, current use, um, but they're all uh, very appropriate to um, uh, you know what needs to be done? Well, it, it, it's interesting because I, I didn't hear that kind of high-mindedness uh, in, uh, in, in Biden's address. And it's, it's interesting because uh, there are a substantial number of Americans who feel that uh, we, we were prior to COVID on a pretty good track with record low unemployment, and uh, a pretty optimistic look. The stock market, to my surprise, is still cruising along at 30,000. And I remember when the stock market was at 1,500. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so 5%. I, I, <laughs> yeah, I like you, I'm amazed that, 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 the, that the stock market is 
as high as it is, I think uh, as the residual fallout of, uh, from all of these uh, executive orders, you know, you know it, it's one thing to, with the stroke of a pen, uh, eliminate 8,000 union jobs. But uh, I was listening to the governor, governor of uh, one of the Western states this morning that, um, you know, in Wyoming, that uh, almost 50% of their land is federal land. And um, now there will be no drilling on federal land. And all of a sudden, the income that came from that to the state is not going to be there. Along with, and of course, he's a Republican governor, but there are several Democratic states like Louisiana that are going to have the same situation. So I, it will be interesting to see over time uh, how, the, how the market treats this. Well, and I think that I think the key element on this is also going to be the 2022 election, because some of these folks and Joe Manchin comes to mind, the uh, uh, Democrat senator from West Virginia, whose state is a definitely trending conservative, uh, a relatively poor state, despite it, the fact that it trends conservative and the mining jobs there. And it it, it reflects a, a substantial sense of insensitivity. Like I said, I think Biden's inauguration address was very insensitive. And certainly, even if he uses the word unify, it certainly wasn't magnanimous in any oh. regard, in any way that term could be interpreted. And I think it's, it's, uh, it's unfortunate because it, it's one thing to get elected. It's another thing to govern well. And with the challenges to energy independence, the unemployment rate, uh, the the ener the uh, overseas respect that the United States has, and you know a lot of people have made a lot of the the fact that Trump had a lot of detractors in international uh, diplomacy, and you know my response to that might be a little different than some other people. When you tell people cover your own expenses, pay your bills pay your dues to NATO and the United Nations and stop cheating America. Your countries are doing fine. Stop cheating American trade deals. I'm sitting here as your very basic business person. I'm a business professor saying, I could understand that they're not going to be Donald Trump's biggest cheerleaders, but I liked those positions. I may not have been a huge Donald Trump fan, but I supported those concepts and I, that's our allies. And then the flip side of it is our enemies who shouldn't be our enemies. I mean, there's no reason for China to be our enemies. I have co-authors in China and the, I think one of the reasons that things can run like they do in China is because the average Chinese person is not political. America, where a lot of us are political, over there, they've become brain dead, deadened to the whole political scene, and it kind of runs at its own level at a very different position. So the CCP may be against the United States because they don't like the United States not kowtowing to them up to now. And I think it's interesting, in the first two weeks since Biden's been in office, Iran has told us they are dictating terms before they will meet us for peace talks. China has told us they will dictate terms before they'll meet us for peace talks, to which I say, I don't think so. And I sure hope Joe Biden will grow a spine um, and push back a little bit. Yeah, we, we, we'd like to think that, uh, of course, uh, his, his son being on Chinese boards and, and Russian boards <laughs> uh, uh, you know, might have an influence on that. Uh, and, and relative to NATO, you know, they may decry that he uh, told them to do what they were supposed to be doing, but you know what? Now they're paying their share, fair share, and NATO is more powerful and more effective as a result. So it becomes a win-win-win situation. <clears throat> Excuse me. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, Hyatt, we we try and keep these things fairly short. As you know, we recorded two segments before we recorded your segment. So I'm going to thank you very much for being here today. It is an absolute pleasure to, uh, to have your inputs today. And this, again, is Saving America, 
uh, for the second week of February 2021. And we thank you. This is Dr. David D. Shine, and join us again in the future.